So today, if you are a note taker, Genesis 10 to 11, verse 26. And the title is Pride Leads to a Fall. Pride Leads to a Fall. Genesis 10 and most of 11. Now, we are going to see two major events really happening today. Chapter 10 is going to be, well, maybe not an event is the wrong word, but a list, a table, as it were, of nations. And they really flow out of Genesis chapter 11's event called the Tower of Babel, the dispersing of the nations. So to set the context, you guys know this, you remember this. Genesis, the first half, has four great events, and the second half has four great people. We're going to start those next week with Abraham. But in the first half, we saw creation, then the fall. God made everything perfect, but man sinned. And then we saw the flood, how the wicked and violent generation across the world had to be cleaned, wiped away. Tragic as it was, it was also mercy because God saved Noah and his family. And then in that period, we just studied it wasn't going so well after the flood because Noah fell into drunkenness even, and then his son, one of them, went really bad. We saw that last week. And today we're going to see that the world after the flood wasn't in a great state, and so the fourth event happens, the Tower of Babel. Genesis 10 is an amazing chapter. Historically speaking, there's, it's unparalleled. Around the world, uh, there's so much about the different cultures and nations that spread out around the world. And Genesis 10 is one, an amazing historical document that Moses was inspired to add in and to include here. William F. Albright, not a believer, but a leading authority on the Middle East in history, he talked about Genesis 10 and he said, it stands absolutely alone in ancient literature without a remote parallel. The table of nations, he said, remains an astonishingly accurate document. And so it's remarkable in its history because it shows us all the culture groups that went out from uh, Noah's family. And it could only have been compiled by either an eyewitness or by divine inspiration. And the Bible is actually both of those things, written by eyewitnesses, passed on to Moses, but also under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he put this together for us. So we can know the history of our world, but not just academic history. This isn't just here to be a history lesson. There's a, a deep lesson about faith in this story and about our walk with God that we really need to be open to with our hearts as well as our minds. I spent a lot of time this week really looking through the history here in Genesis 10. And you'll see there's a lot of names. We'll see 70 different names mentioned. I won't end up reading every single one of them. Um, but they all come from the offspring of Noah. And it's amazing that when you read these lists, we just need to remember that God cares about people, and he knows your name. It even says when we put our faith in Christ that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Your name is. As you've trusted in Jesus as your Savior, your name. And Revelation goes on to say we have assurance that we'll be able to worship him in eternity in heaven because our name is written down. Isn't that awesome? So when you read this, uh, it, we don't skip over it. Even when we study the Bible, we, we don't skip it because it's so rich in the love of God as well as the actual history that is here. Now, I just need to find something here in my notes because I went ahead for a while. <laughs> we sometimes have the question, how did we get from Noah's story, if, which was, we've studied as real history, to the 
national diversity and cultural diversity of our day that's spread around the globe. How do we get from A to B? And this really describes how that happened. Today, there are around 200 distinct countries in the world, and many of those countries have multiple languages. I'm not just talking about <laughs> English and French. In some countries, they have 70, 100 different dialects and languages in, in one nation. And so how did all this happen? Well, the Bible gives us the answers. And I, I am curious, how much of the world have you experienced outside of where you live? Because sometimes we think of life as just our street <laughs> nowadays, <laughs> our house, <laughs> maybe our town or our city or our province. But, you know, I grew up in Europe. I had the privilege of uh, seeing quite a bit of, of that continent. I think I've been to 17 different countries which is still nothing compared to the diversity of our planet. And maybe some of you have been to many more uh, places around the world. My, my uh, mom is English, I grew up in, in near Oxford, and my dad is German, so he's from the Black Forest. And so we would take um, our car, drive to the English Channel, and we didn't have the train underneath the English Channel back then. We used a hovercraft and got in our car and, and like a ferry went across to Europe, and then we would drive to see family in Germany, and in one minute we're in France, the next minute we're in Belgium, then we're in Holland or whatever, then, then we're in Luxembourg, then we're in, down in Germany, then we go pop over to Switzerland, and then we're in Austria, and it was like, wow, I'm seeing all these different cultures as a teenager growing up. And it was quite a fascinating, eye-opening thing. And then I got to travel to Israel and to Brazil and, and, and different pilgrimage and mission trip, and, and, and the world is so amazing how spread out and how diverse it all is. And sometimes we don't see the big picture. We just think of our own living room, <laughs> you know, right now. And I just want to encourage you that this shows us the bigger picture, that God is mapping out a whole big plan, and it all actually leads toward Jesus Christ at the end of this chapter, because God's over it all. I know it's a little cruel for me to talk about travel right now, 2021 doesn't really look like much of a travel year, does it? As frustrating as that is, I want to encourage you that there are many, many people around the world who would absolutely love right now to live here. We live in, relatively speaking, one of the most chilled out places in the world, in Regina. <laughs> and uh, I really believe we're blessed to be here. And so, yes, it's frustrating we can't travel, but relax and enjoy what we have, right? And thank God for our blessings. Now, let's start in verse 1. It says, this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So there's going to be three branches to the tree. And sons were born to them after the flood. So they come down off the ark, and God said, if you remember back in chapter 9, verse 1, go out and fill the earth multiply and, and go to every corner. And so Noah's sons come out of the ark and they've got their wives and they start having children. And now we see three different branches that actually do eventually, after chapter 11's event of the Babel Tower, eventually they go out into all the corners of the world. And so it is interesting that all the cultures of our planet can trace their roots if they knew the history which a lot of it is lost, but the truth is it goes back to Noah and his family, one family and all the nations and cultures that are so diverse. The Bible teaches that there is one human race, that the idea of different human races, we know that to actually be a concept of evolution. In the theory of evolution, which is so different from Scripture, it has been taught that various human races evolved out of different ancestors in a parallel evolution model, which would then lend to the idea of racism and one race being evolutionary superior to another. And it's been used to persecute and to harm, and it comes from evolution. The Bible teaches there's one race. Every single group and tribe comes back to Noah's family and if you do an honest appraisal of sciences, like biology, genetics, or archaeology and linguistics, 
it all reveals the great evidence for the scripture and the biblical model that we're all one blood, we're all related, we're all one race. So even the term racism isn't really a valid term. Yes, we have different ethnic backgrounds. Yes, we have different languages and customs. And if, but if we go back far enough, we have every single reason from this chapter to practice and believe in absolute equality of the human race on every level. That's a biblical concept. I want you to know that. The Bible teaches we're all one, one blood. And Revelation 5 tells us that one day in heaven, there'll be a song and a praise before the throne of God that says this, you are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood, Jesus, out of every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. So one day the unity will be there at the throne of God like we can only imagine. And salvation today is open to every single person of every ethnicity and of every people group. And because we are one blood, back here to Genesis 10 verse 1, Jesus shed his blood for everyone. And there should be no attitude of superiority in us toward anybody. And I pray for a more multicultural experience in, in the kingdom of God as we experience it here at Calvary Chapel, Regina, because I think it's beautiful. Now, the big purpose we'll get to at the end of the sermon is that this line, these names, all lead to Jesus Christ, to the Messiah, to the promise. But let's go through them. Let's start with the first branch, Japheth, verse 2. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus. And the sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Rephath, and Togarma. The sons of Javan were Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. And from these, the coastland people of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. Now, these ancient names all correlate to modern areas that we would have different names for today, but the, there's a correlation from the history and the people group to the current uh, culture. Obviously, there's a complex science to linking this history to our modern time. And I, I was not able to study it all this week. <laughs> but you know what? History and the movement of ancient tribes is, is, is very advanced in the study through linguistics. And that's how we can actually track all this. I'm not a historian, I'm not a linguist, but an expert on these ancient tribes, uh, they're, they're, they publish material that I can read and I can present to you what I learn. <laughs> and the main clues are all in the languages. Now, the sons of Japheth here, Gomer would refer to the Germanic tribes, which includes the French, the Spanish, the British Isles, and the Celtic settlers that came from this line of Gomer. Magog would be the ancient Scythians, which actually would be the modern-day Russians and the area around the Black Sea. So if you have a Russian or a French or a German background or whatever, you're connected back to Japheth. Madai would be the Medes, Javan the ancient Greeks and Ionians, Tubal would be the Turks, Meshech the Slavs, and Tiras would be the Etruscans who were in Italy and then were swallowed up by uh, the Roman Empire. And then the sons of Gomer, verse 3, goes now a couple more generations down. You have Ashkenaz. Maybe you've heard of the Ashkenazis. Now, who are they? Well, it's interesting. The Greeks um, have a different word for the Ashkenazis. And the word, I found this funny, is Reginans or, Re or Reginians. And so they, who are the ancient Reginians? There was a tribe in, in Europe, and, and they were actually the ones who settled around the Rhine River, which is in Germany, on the west side of modern-day Germany, which is where my father is from. So I am more of a Reginian than I realized I was. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the Ashkenaz tribe, and of course the Jewish uh, Germans relate to that today. Uh, Togarma, that would be Armenia and Turkey, and they come up in future prophecy. Verse 5, it says they, they spread out through boats and things, coastlands and 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 different languages. And so the event that caused all this is going to be described more in chapter 11. Now in verse 6, we come to the next branch, Ham. 
The descendants of Ham, and he has four sons. And remember, he was the son who went bad in the last chapter with his attitude toward Noah. Verse 6 says, the sons of Ham were Cush. Now some of Cush went to modern Iraq, and some went to Ethiopia. And then, uh, it, then it, the, the other three go to North Africa. It says Mizraim, that would be Egypt. Put would be Libya and Canaan. Well, they actually ended up in the land of Israel uh, the Canaanite land that was there before the Jews inhabited uh, Israel. Verse 7, the sons of Cush were Seba, Havala, Sapta, Rama, and Saptaka. Now these have all been absorbed into other tribes in history, so I'm not sure who they are. And the sons of Rama were Sheba and Dedan. Now interesting, some of those went to uh, Ethiopia, the queen of Sheba, it's all connected there. But actually they migrated back into the area of Saudi Arabia. And so the current, uh, when you read Shiva and Dedan in, in prophecy, like in Ezekiel, that's talking about Saudi Arabia, where they settled. And, and they're going to play a part in the future prophecy that, that around the end times events. So interesting. Verse 8, Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it said, like Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erek, Akkad, Kalne, the land of Shinar. And from that land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. So there's a whole bunch of cities led by a man called Nimrod. We'll come back to that. Verse 13 to 19 is the line of Ham continued. And I just want to point out verse 15 is the Canaanites again. It's interesting, it says Canaan begot Sidon, that's the Hittites and ancient Lebanon, and then Heth, and then the Jebusite. That would actually be the area of Jerusalem. And King David will take over Jerusalem, and God will call him to do that, and it takes it over from the Jebusites. And so they're listed back here. The Amorite and the Girgashite, the Hivite and the Archite, and the Sinite, that would be Mount Sinai. And then verse 18 all these different Canaanite tribes, right? The Avrodite, the Zemurite, the Hematite, and the Termites, and, and all these other guys <laughs> that are in here. Uh, verse 20, these are the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands and in their nations. The Canaanites will be featured a lot more in the Old Testament, and so uh, they will become a very wicked pagan tribe or group of tribes who dwell in the promised land, and God calls them to repent of their wickedness that we'll study at some point. It's, it's pretty ugly. Uh, but they don't repent, and they have 400 years to repent, and they don't. And so when the children of Israel come out of Egypt, they wander in the wilderness, and then they go in, and with Joshua, God says, you're to take over this land from the Canaanites and bring the judgment that they have long deserved. So verse 21 Sons of Shem. Now, when you go, when you hear the word Shem, it's like the word Sem or Semitic. And the Semitic people today would be the Jews, but also the Arabs. And they're all cousins. They're all related through Shem, Shem Shemites, the Sem Semites. So go to verse 22. It says the sons of Shem were Elam, that would be the Persians in modern-day Iran. Asher, that would be ancient Assyria. Arpexad, you'll see he's an, an, an ancestor of Abram. And Abraham, of course, is connected to all the major three monotheistic religions of the world. They all come again through this guy. Lud and Aram, ancient Syrians. And also Aram would be the Aramaic language that comes from Aram. And so that would be the language of the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And, and even in Jesus' day, many spoke Aramaic. The sons of Aram were Uz. And Job, if you've ever read the book of Job, he comes from Uz, the land in ancient Arabia. Hul, Gether, and Mash. So they had uh, 90s sitcoms back then. Mash was, was around. <laughs> Verse 24, Arp, or maybe they liked potatoes. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Verse 24, Arpex said begot Salah, and Salah begot Eber, and Eber to him were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. This is interesting. Look at verse 25. For in his days, the earth was divided, 
and his brother's name was Joktan. Now, we're not 100% sure what that means, but it's an interesting reference. Either it's talking about the continental shift that would have maybe continued or had a second phase after the flood, or this is a reference to how Seth's line was present in the, the next story we're about to read at the Tower of Babel, the, the dividing of tongues and nations. And, and I kind of suspect that one, but I'm not sure. Verse 26 to 30 lists a number of tribes that come from ancient Arabia, and I'm not going to read them all. But you can see them all, and you can try and read them all sometime. Uh, verse 31 says, There were sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, according to their nations. And these were the families of the sons of Noah according to their generations in their nations. And from these, the nations were divided on earth after the flood. But what caused that division? Well, go back to verse 8. Chapter 10, verse 8, gives us the intro to the event of Babel. It says, Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And then you'll see seven other cities in there. So Cush begot Nimrod. The name Nimrod, if you ever uh, have the rare experience of meeting someone and say, what's your name? And they say, my name's Nimrod. <laughs> that probably has, will not happen. But if it does, you know his name means re rebel, rebellion. This guy, he was truly a rebel, and his name here is definitive of his character. Verse 8 then goes on to say, he began to be a mighty one on the earth, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And therefore it's said, so there's this ancient proverb, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. So when someone acted with might, you'd say, oh, you're like Nimrod. And, and the phrase there doesn't mean, oh, he took his bow and arrow, and he ran out there, and he, he shot a big you know, bore and then came home and the Lord said, oh, that's pretty good, good job, hunter man. It's not like God was pleased. Actually, he's talking here about how he hunted people and how he dominated people. He was like the alpha male, so to speak, but uh, not in a good way, not in a godly way, not as a good leader. And he was before the Lord, meaning he was uh, putting himself before God, meaning he was like, look at me, it's all about me, I trust me. And if you don't, I'm going to beat you up. Like he was the bully of the ancient world. And you say, well, what did that look like? Well, verse 10 says the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. So he had his own kingdom. He wasn't interested in the kingdom of God. He wasn't interested in obeying chapter 9, verse 1, go out and fill the earth. He wanted everyone to come and serve him. He was the first lord, so to speak, the first dictator over the world. And I say the world because you read that there's seven cities and they're all between, basically, they're all in modern Iraq, between ancient Babylon and Nineveh. But that was the world because we're talking here Noah and then Ham and then Cush and then Nimrod. So we're talking only four generations. So the world is only a few hundred or thousand people at this time. We're not talking about millions and millions of people. We're not talking global like Google Maps, like spread it out or get a globe and look around the world. The world was very isolated in that Iraq area, and they were not spreading because Nimrod was saying, it's all about me, and I'm going to build my kingdom, and if you disobey, I'm going to hunt you down. So he was the first world leader and dictator, and he was basically taking the place of of God. He was saying, it's me before God. So in a way, he's like a mini antichrist, saying, it's all about me, and you must worship me. And that's, that's, that's scary. And so God's going to come in here and bring a, some, he's going to deal with Nimrod, and he's going to deal with the people, because what ends up happening is the people start actually following him. He must have also been a very skillful and charismatic leader, he put down those who rebelled against his rebellion. But actually, a lot of people ended up following him and, and willingly going along with his plan. And we see that in chapter 11, verse 1. Now, the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that would be where the ark was in Ararat, 
that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, that would be the area of Babel in Iraq, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, and you can imagine it's Nimrod who is leading the charge. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad across the face of the earth, lest we obey God and scatter abroad. <laughs> Do you see that? Lest we obey chapter 9, verse 1. And, and so this whole movement now becomes a popular, uh, and, and what's crazy is you read that and it sounds good in a way, like let's have unity, let's gather together, come together over me, says Nimrod, as he's singing the Beatles song out loud, I don't know, but he's basically going, it's all about coming together, guys, against God, and that's not good. Now, unity is a wonderful thing. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. It's wonderful. But when people unify against God, it doesn't go so well. And that's what's going to happen here. You can see they're all gathering in this area of Shinar, which is Babel. By the way, the word Babel means gateway to God. So when he finds, uh, Nimrod founds his kingdom, his first city, his principal city is gateway to God, Babel. But what's interesting is in the Hebrew, the word Babel also sounds like confusion. So God's going to actually twist it and actually confuse these people in the midst of their uh, false worship of, of their own way. Let's talk about that. Go on to verse uh, 4. You see there the motive. Come, let us build ourselves a city, a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for God. No, 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 ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad. So the whole purpose here is pride. And it tells us in verse 3, they had brick for stone and asphalt for mortar. And, and you put that together, and, and this is possibly what was happening. Archaeologists have confirmed that brick and asphalt construction was common in ancient Babylon. And the benefit of those two materials was you could build things that were strong, but also that were waterproof. And so as they're building this tower, they're saying, we're rebelling against God. We're not going to scatter we're all about Nimrod and ourselves. And if God chooses to flood us again, we're going to build something that's so strong and waterproof that he can't. And they're completely disbelieving of God's promise that he would actually never flood the world again, that God is merciful. And they reject God's promise. And so the idea here is that there is a, a religion that they are forming that is based on pride and self and the exaltation of man. And they're looking to get to heaven their own way. Now, how do I know that? Because look at verse 4. And a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Now, the idea here isn't that they're trying to get up to the sky. Otherwise, why would they build in the plain of Shinar? Why not start in the mountains of Ararat? The idea here is they want to look up to the heavens. They want to worship in their own way, putting their faith and trust in what they see in the sky. Can you guess what that is? Ancient Babylonian religions have come out, uh, and many false religions have come out of this part of history, and it all centers around astrology. So when they're building this tower, there is a sense that we want to look up to the stars and be guided. We want to look up to the stars, and we want to worship in our own way. And so there's a, a demonic and an, an, an occult movement in the construction of this tower to pull people away from worshiping the God of the Bible to a false religion and a false worship. And, and there's a fascinating study. We can talk more about that on Thursday, about the Babylonian history. And uh, it's, it's amazing. But astrology is not something we as Christians practice. We don't, we don't look to the horoscopes to get wisdom and guidance. We look to the word of God. And God speaks to us and God shows us his truth in the Bible. And it doesn't really matter what your sign is that you were assigned by the birth date or whatever, because that means nothing. God created those stars. God put them there. And, and he's got a purpose for them that we'll talk about more in the future. But, 
but really we get wisdom and guidance from scripture not from occult practices like horoscopes we just don't go there as christians it's not uh, uh, godly worship it's false worship and that's when they say we're looking up to the heavens that's what they were doing now god makes it clear in history at this time how he wanted them to worship do you remember how it was it was through animal sacrifice that was called substitutionary atonement and it was way back adam and eve remember god's gonna cover their sin with the skin of an animal and cover their shame instead of fig leaves they get a, a sacrifice to cover them and then abel and cain they were bringing their offerings to the lord and and, and abel was a a farmer bringing his sacrifice and it pleased the lord and then we see that with noah when they come off the ark they bring all the clean animals and they offer a sacrifice and we know today we don't have to worship with an animal sacrifice because it was all fulfilled by jesus the lamb of god on the cross who takes away the sin of the world but god always wanted to be worshiped his way and they're saying no we're going to worship god our way we're going to do this uh, in our power for our name so this was you could say the first organized religion the first false religion not spiritual not godly not biblical and it's bringing this unity that is anti-god so this is going to deserve and require some uh, of god dealing with it otherwise the whole world is going to be destroyed by this pride so how does god deal with it well verse five it says but the lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built and the lord said indeed the people are one and they all have one language and this is what they begin to do now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them come let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech so the lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they ceased building the city therefore its name is called babel or confusion because there the lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth now we've seen in only 11 chapters god bring judgment on the with the curse and then bring the the great flood and now god's going to act in a third way to judge but don't think god is just like angry <laughs> this is taking place over many many years and generations long period of time and now we get to the point where the human race is going down into this human pride and rebellion against god and and they're they're it's even greater than nimrod like nimrod could just die and and the people were still going in this way of worshiping uh, with astrology and the zodiac and all of that and it was it was sinful and it was wrong and god wanted them to spread out and god says well this isn't working you're not obeying so i've got to come in and i've got to deal with the human race again so verse 5 there it said he came down to see the city god didn't do this without full knowledge does that mean he came down in the form of a man the son of god coming before bethlehem uh, and walking in babel and taking a look at himself or, or what i don't know for sure but definitely god judged here with full information verse 5. 6 says that the lord says man these people they're of one language and this is what they begin to do so nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them underline that see the potential of fallen man is terrible and powerful and god to put a limit on the destructive nature of man's pride with and unity without god god has to put a limit on that otherwise it's going to uh, be an irreversible course think of the horrific accomplishments that man can do when he has power think of dictators even in the last hundred years and how destructive they can be that's what's going on here so verse 7 come let us go down see us there is another reference to the trinity and let us confuse their language so they won't understand each other and then we'll scatter them abroad so the lord scatters them now how did that happen well i imagine all these families maybe thousands of people are, are in the city they're building this tower they're worshiping the astrology and and all of a sudden as they come to keep construction and they've got their 
bag with their hammer and their tools, and the next guy's over here, and the foreman comes, and all of a sudden, the Lord just says, confusion. And, and they all start, that family's going to speak English. That's really the most confusing thing in the world. Let's, let's start with that one. And this family is going to speak Swahili. Let's see how they get along. And this family, French. <laughs> this family, German. <sighs> it's all coming out. And, and suddenly these people are like, they cannot understand each other. Imagine the frustration. Imagine the, the humiliation. Like, imagine you're the foreman, and all your employees are speaking gibberish. And they can't even understand each other, and, and you're just like, stop it! <laughs> and they can't. And, and, and they think you've lost your mind. <laughs> and maybe that sounds like your workplace. I don't know. But uh, that's what was going on. Babel, confusion, absolute. This is a divine uh, scattering that God is going to perform. And so they go home and they see their families. I imagine families could still talk because then they go out and chapter 10 that we just studied, they go to Europe, they go to India, they go to Africa, they go to Arabia, and they spread out around the world. And, and so God scatters the nations. And that's how God did it. Now imagine if they had just simply obeyed chapter 9, verse 1, go into the world and, and, and fill the earth. Then you know what would happen? They would never have had other languages. They would have filled the earth with one language and would still be able to just speak in one language. Wouldn't that be precious? But you know, when we choose to rebel against God, we can't win. God will win and we will lose. And that's how this worked. Now the world has all these cultural groups, which is fantastic. God ordained the nations. God put everyone out there. And God allowed groups to go and, and, and form separate from each other and have their own distinct cultures, their own distinct uh, ethnicities and genetics and their own distinct um, you know, flow of, of, of tradition. But, we can't, but, but, but without a lot of work, we can't even talk to each other. That's the real challenge. And that wasn't necessary. God never actually designed it that way. Interesting, hey? When we disobey God, we will pay the consequence and God will win. <laughs> I remember going to Europe with my wife. After we got married, I thought, I got to show her England and Germany where I grew up, and I got to, you know, four years went by uh, from our marriage to when we could actually afford to go, and we went, and it was just us, and I was, like, calling up all my old family and friends, and, like, we're going to come, and it was kind of crazy, because back then we didn't have smartphones, so it was, like, you had these little things called travel books. Do you remember those? And you have to, like, call numbers from, like, pay phones to book hotels. We get to one city where we actually went through Switzerland, and uh, it was our first time in a Germanic area, and, and I hadn't spoken German for years because I grew up around it, but I, I'm not fluent. But I, mean, I know enough to get by, and Megan doesn't really know anything about my German. And so we get there, and she's like, How are we, where are we going to stay? I was like, uh, I think I got a plan. And I went over to a payphone at the train station, picked it up, and, and dialed the hostel. And, and then I started speaking German to this lady. And I was really scared because I don't know what, how to book a hotel room in German. But the words came back to me. And Megan was like, whoa, who is this guy I'm married to? And, it all came, and the woman, we booked a room in German. It was amazing. And I, I felt so helpless making the call. But, but God helped me. And Megan thought I was a hero. And then the truth is, by halfway through the conversation, I just was honest and said, Sprechen Sie English? <laughs> and she said, OK, let's talk English. Because <laughs> uh, a lot of Europeans have a lot more discipline learning languages than, than us English speakers. So I wasn't really a hero. But that helpless feeling, the humility that comes when you can't understand each other. Imagine in our church, imagine this, all of a sudden, we all start speaking gibberish and we can't understand. Like, it would be so frustrating. That's so humbling. Imagine that in a whole culture. And God is bringing down the pride of man. God is saying, enough is enough. And God ordained nations. God sent them out and said, you can go and create your own groups and fill this earth. And the diversity of nations around our world is a beautiful thing. Now, when this all took place, 
it wasn't a beautiful thing. This was a humbling and a frustrating thing. But I want you to think of the Tower of Babel in light of the gospel for a moment. When Jesus rose again, people saw him and they believed and they realized he died for their sins. The disciples, it says that there was about 120 of them who had followed all the way and, and then they saw him and they believed and they were waiting. Jesus said, wait here in Jerusalem. And the book of Acts, in chapter 2, they're waiting in Jerusalem, 120, and they're actually mostly from Galilee. So they speak kind of like, we would almost say like a Nufi version of Hebrew. <laughs> they're, they're like, you know, a little bit odd, these people. Not that you're odd if you're a Newfoundlander. Sorry, Sheldon. But, uh, <laughs> but their language is a little primitive, and they're waiting and they're praying. And you know what happens? The day of Pentecost fully comes. And the Holy Spirit descends, and the church is born, the first ever filling of the Spirit. And you know what happens? God gives them languages, tongues. And they start singing and worshiping and praising God in languages they knew nothing of. And it's a beautiful experience because it's a sign in a way, to all the Jews, because it was the day of Pentecost, all the Jews from, it lists 17 different uh, Roman provinces of the day, from Italy to Turkey to Russia to Arabia to Africa, all these people, these Jews are in Jerusalem to worship the Jewish feast, and they hear the singing in their own languages, and they're shocked. And, and it says that Peter steps out, and all the people are there praising, and the, and, and the Jewish pilgrims are Wow, these Galileans are singing in my language. Those are beautiful words. How would you know that? And Peter hushes the crowd, and he preaches the gospel to them. And it says that 3,000 people, all Jews from around the world, coming together, got saved. They trusted in Jesus Christ that day because of this, this reversal of Babel that God was doing. You see, Babel was all about Unite against God. And God said, no, disperse. But now, God says, unite in Christ. And real unity is found in Jesus Christ. And we see that in the book of Acts with this reversing of Babel and these languages and everyone coming together from all over the known world and worshiping Jesus together. And they didn't have a microphone and speakers. They didn't have people ready to counsel and, and hand out Bibles. But 3,000 people got saved in one day. And they became the church in Jerusalem that started Christianity. And they went out from there and scattered around the world. Jesus told them, you're going to go to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, even as far as Regina, Saskatchewan, with the gospel message. Yeah. And that's where we are today. And you know what? We are one in Christ Jesus. And true unity is found when we come together in God, not together against God. You guys, think of the future implications of coming together against God, which is the current ev event in our world right now. Do you realize that what is happening geopolitically and economically and with this pandemic, you realize what's happening is an acceleration of globalism, which is nothing more than a return to Babel, which is a unity against God, without God. And the Bible teaches in future prophecy that one day there will be a one world dictator again. And there will be a one-world government, a one-world currency that will solve all the problems. There's a lot of talk about that right now. The Great Reset and the World Economic Forum. We're going to get into it a bit on Thursday night because what's happening is a return to Babel. And the Bible says that when that happens, that unity, which unity is a great thing, but when it comes together against Christ and that leader who will rise up and will be uh, there'll be a demonic deception in the world 
And people will say, he's the guy. He's the charismatic leader who's going to save us. And he will be the Antichrist. And he will eradicate every form of godly, biblical, Jesus-centered worship. And every person who worships Jesus will be eradicated. That's coming. And, and, and we're living in days where people are trying to restore Babel. Not literally the place, although that may feature at some point in future prophecy, but the idea that we can be one against God and we can be unified without Jesus. It doesn't work. It's human-centered. That's why it doesn't work. Because when we try and build things around humans, they don't work. Because we're fallen, we're sinful, we're self-centered. But when we, have, when we come into Christ, we have true unity. True unity that lasts for eternity. I can't wait to be in heaven and to bow down at the throne of God with every tribe and tongue and nation and sing. You guys, this morning I experienced a little bit of the unity that's in Christ. When we walked in down this hallway, we were about to come in for worship practice, and there was a gentleman doing the cleaning uh, with a mop and bucket in that hallway. And he was clearly from Africa and was a recent immigrant. And I stopped and said, hello. And my name's Colin, what's your name? And he said his name, and I can't remember it. <laughs> it was a name I'd never heard before. And, you know, with masks, it's a little hard sometimes in different languages or dialects. And, but, but what was cool is we looked each other in the eye, and he said to me, is that a church? I said, yeah. We meet on Sundays for, for church. And he goes, cool. And I said, what, do you go to church? And he said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I love Jesus. And, and I'm working today, and I go to another church down the road, and, and then we had to go. And I just thought, there it is. We had unity, true unity. Even though we only just met, and we're from completely different backgrounds and, and everything, true unity is found in Jesus Christ, not unifying over man, but unifying over Jesus. And that's what the Bible teaches. Now, Jesus is the center of this chapter. I want to close off by looking at the last portion. It says in verse 10, this is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was 100 years old when he begot Arphaxad two years after the flood. And after he begot Arphaxad, Shem lived 500 years and had sons and daughters. And you can go down and just kind of look. There's 10 generations to verse 26. It goes Shem, Arphaxad, then Salah, then Eber, then Peleg in 16, and then Ru in 18, and verse 20, he begot Sarug, in verse 22, begot Nahor, verse 24, Nahor begot Terah. And why is this interesting to us? Because look at Terah's son. Verse 26, now Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So the world is spread out. Now all these nations are forming or these cultures, groups, and, and tribes. And, and God says, it's time for me to, res to keep building my plan to bring in a savior for sin. And God picks a man called Abram. And next week, we'll start the story of Abraham. But God is going to bring, not just scatter everyone and, and, and hold back all the destruction of, of pride, but God's going to say, I've got a solution. And before I send my Savior, I'm going to raise up a man who's going to be a man of faith. His name is Abraham. Now, how does all that work? Remember the curse when they sinned with the serpent and the temptation? And God said to Eve, I'm going to give you a seed, a seed of the woman, who will crush the head of Satan, even though Satan bruises him his heel. And you follow all these genealogies from Adam and Eve to Noah to Shem down to Abraham. And then you keep going through the Bible and you get to Judah and then you get to David and then you get to Mary who is the woman. And then the seed of the woman in the Virgin Mary. The seed is Jesus Christ. And so when we read Verse 10 to 26, this is the trace of the promise. The promise from chapter 3, 
a savior, a solution to the heart of sin. It starts here in chapter 3, all the way through here, chapter 11, and goes all the way to Mary. And we're going to see when we get to the Gospels one day, the genealogy picks up again and, and goes all the way back here to Shem. It's amazing. See, God is faithful. When God makes a promise to you, he will keep it. And when God makes his love known to you, he doesn't take it away. He loves you. And he's promised to you that it's all about his resources, his grace, his power, his work through our weakness. And he never takes that back. And whatever you're going through today, you can rely on the promise of God because he is faithful. You can rely on the grace of God because he's able. You can rely on the work and the leading of the Holy Spirit because in our weakness, he is strong. And God wants to be showing you his faithfulness. Now, all these genealogies tie together to end in Jesus, and it just reminds us that all of history, even the nations as they are today, is all controlled and overseen by God. Have you ever thought of that word history, like break it up? His story. God is in control of it all. And all of history belongs to him. And future prophecy is just the mold that God is going to pour the rest of history into. He's already planned it out. And we know that Jesus wins. And that one day, well, 2,000 years ago, he came. The seed of the, of the woman and he died for our sins so we can know God. And we can be right with God by faith in Jesus Christ. And one day he's coming back again. And you know what? There's going to be a one world leader one day who's really, really good. His name is Jesus Christ. And that is coming. After the Antichrist, after he, he gets dealt with, then Jesus will rule and reign over this world. And we'll have finally unity across the whole world that is centered on Jesus Christ. So we have a lot of hope, even in these days. Let's close with Proverbs chapter 16. And here's the application. Say, so well, how does all this information really apply to my daily walk? Well, here's something. <laughs> First of all, keep Jesus in the center. Build his kingdom with your life. If you're building your own kingdom right now, you're spinning your wheels. And you might as well just pause and, and repent and say, Lord, it's time for me to live for you. And here's a verse that describes it all. Chapter 16, verse 18 of Proverbs says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Tower of Babel. 19, better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Better to choose humility even if you don't join the popular group that's all claiming, you know, man's power. Because God will, will lift up the humble. God will reward those who humble themselves under his word, under his mighty hand, and who trust in Jesus Christ. It takes humility to be right with God, to say it's not about me. My life is not about me. I'm here to serve you and to serve others and myself Last. You ever seen that acronym? Jesus first, others second, myself, yourself last. J-O-Y. It's joy. Put Jesus first. Build his kingdom. And put others second and put yourself last. And that's humility. That's the way of God. And that's true unity. And we have that through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen? So, Father, thank you so much that you love us and that you've given us the word of God, that today we know that in Jesus we, tr we have true unity, that in Jesus we have true purpose, and that in Jesus we have the unconditional love and the unfailing truth of God. Thank you that you're faithful. And would you help us to walk in humility? Lord, show us where there is pride and we think this is all about us. Help us to knock that down voluntarily before you knock us off our perch. Lord, help us 
to humble ourselves and walk with you and to appreciate the blessings you've given us. And Lord, help us to share the good news, the message of real hope and unity that is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the hope that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen.